We live in some very interesting times. That is both a curse and a blessing. Back over 20 years ago, this is what politics looked like in the United States. You may say, hang on a second, I thought this talk was about climate change. You'll see where we're going in just two minutes. Back 22 years ago, this is what the United States looked like. Republicans and Democrats, relatively normal symmetrical distributions, relatively close together. What has happened over the intervening 20 years? People have grown further apart and more towards the edges. Why does political polarization matter? It matters because it determines all kinds of things. If you could believe it, we have gotten to the point today where the number one determinant of who someone will marry if they are not already married is not race, socioeconomic status, intelligence, appearance. It is where we fall in the political spectrum. That is the world that we live in today. Yesterday, the Pew Foundation, or actually maybe even this morning, the Pew Foundation published a brand new study and I found it this morning, and it's in here right now. This study, I know, this is what you call hot off the presses. This study asked people many questions, and they divided the answers into people who are planning to vote for Trump and people who are planning to vote for Clinton. They said, is climate change mostly human, orange, mostly natural, green, or not happening at all, gray? There is an enormous difference. And in fact, if you look through this Pew study, which has a wealth of figures and graphs and information, you will see that they actually rank the issues like ISIS and gun control and abortion and immigration and climate change. They rank them in terms of which issues Democrats and Republicans most disagree on. Guess which one is at the top of the list? Climate change. We live in a world where climate change is the most politically polarized topic in the United States. So conversations like climate change usually go something like this. I'm Susie. Susie and Calvin are arguing over climate change. Susie brings the 10-foot stack of IPCC reports that have been published since 1990. Calvin replies with his political identity. The conversation does not build any bridges, it does not make any progress, it digs a trench, and it ends usually something like this. Whether that is Susie or Calvin's head blowing up, it really depends, it can happen both ways. So I wanna talk about four things. I wanna talk, first of all, about as a scientist, what do we know for sure? Because, as my husband says, who is not a scientist, he's a linguist and a pastor, he said something very acute, he said, a thermometer is not Democrat or Republican. It does not give you a different answer depending on how you vote. So what does science tell us that will not give us a different answer depending on where we fall in the political spectrum? Science tells us, number one, that whenever you burn coal, gas, or oil, it produces carbon dioxide. You can measure it coming out of the tailpipes of our cars and out of the smokestacks of our factories. It is basic physics and chemistry. Science also tells us that we have been burning a lot of it. We keep good records of things that we pay for, and when we pay for coal and gas and oil, we write it down. So we know how much of this stuff we have been burning since the 1800s. We also know, without a shadow of a doubt, that carbon dioxide traps heat. Our planet already has a natural blanket that keeps us almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we would be otherwise but we are adding to that natural blanket, wrapping an extra blanket around our planet with these heat-trapping gases that we didn't need, and that is why our planet is heating up. We know that the Earth's temperature is increasing. Now, one year might be colder or warmer than the next. That's weather. But over climate time scales of 10, 20, 30 years, we see a steady increase in the planet's temperature as well as a steady increase in carbon dioxide levels. And they are not a statistically correlated sample. For a while there, there was actually a really good correlation between pirates and global temperature. 
This is not a statistical correlation. We can measure the heat trapping abilities of carbon dioxide in a lab, and I did it myself as an undergraduate student. Even if we don't trust thermometers, even if we don't trust satellite instruments, if we look at the world around us, if we look at plants, insects, animals moving poleward, glaciers melting, sea level rising, in the world around us, there are more than 26 and a half thousand indicators of a warming planet. This is what we know, regardless of where we fall on the political spectrum. And here's something you might not know yet. How long have we known about this natural blanket that keeps our planet from being a frozen ball of ice? We've known about it since the days of Fourier in the early 1800s. How long have we known that fossil fuel use was wrapping an extra blanket around the planet? We have known since Tyndall there in the 1850s. Yes, you heard that right. We have known for 165 years that fossil fuel use is wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. How long have we actually been able to estimate or model what our fossil fuel use will do in the future? Arrhenius right here in the 1890s built the first climate model by hand. It took him two years to calculate how much the Earth would warm if we doubled or tripled carbon dioxide levels. He was amazingly and humblingly close to what our most powerful supercomputers get today. And he did that in the 1890s. It took him two years to finish his calculations, and about Christmas after the first year, his wife packed up and left. I take this very close to heart because I am a climate modeler also, but we have big computers these days, so we just set stuff up to run, and then we go have dinner with our family. And then we go back and check it again around midnight. How long have we been able to measure the warming of the planet in response to fossil fuel emissions? Since the days of Guy Callender, in 1938, he published a paper saying, I'm going to propose something that I realize that most of you will think is completely ridiculous, but I will attempt to prove to you how it is possible to measure the warming of the planet in response to fossil fuel emissions in 1938. Isn't that crazy? This is what we know. What else do we know? There's a few other things we know that we haven't known for 150 years, but we, we've known them for a while, and they're quite solid, too. We know that when we look at ice core records, this is records of ice core data going back 400,000 years. This is looking at carbon dioxide, and this is looking at temperature. We know that there are these regular cycles of cold periods and warm interglacials. Cold, warm, cold, warm, oops. We are no longer in the natural cycle right now. In fact, when we look at all the natural reasons why climate has changed in the past, which is the first thing we do as a climate scientist, the first thing we do is not assume humans are causing it to change. The first thing we do is look at the natural causes. And we say, could it be the sun? But the sun's energy has been going down for the last 40 years. So if we were being controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler, not warmer. Could it be natural cycles like El Nino? But natural cycles like El Nino, all they do is move heat around from north to south or from the ocean to the atmosphere and back again. And the entire planet is warming. It isn't just a natural cycle moving heat around. Could it be the fact that we're still warming after the last ice age? Well, I don't know if you remember, but one of the favorite myths that I hear all the time is, Back in the 1970s, scientists were warning warning that another ice age was coming. You heard that one? Now, in reality, there was maybe one or two scientists speculating about it, and then there was a big Newsweek story. That was all that there was. Whereas now we have, you know, tens of thousands of articles talking about how humans are causing the planet to warm. Now, here's what you might not expect. The scientists who were speculating that an ice age was coming were correct. Because, according to where we are on the natural cycle, I don't know if you can notice here, this interglacial period is suspiciously long. When you do the calculations, we find that according to the orbital cycles of the Earth, which are very predictable, we should be heading into the next ice age now. And we are not, that's a good thing, 
I don't know about you, but I do not want another ice age. I'm from Canada, and where I grew up would be covered in a mile of ice. But we are heading far, far too far in the other direction. Once we've eliminated these natural suspects, we are left with the fact that it is us humans. But as my program director said to me last year, a man who's very supportive of my work and agrees with the science of climate change, he said to me, you know, Catherine, if you could just tell your colleagues not to be so alarmist, if they could just tone it down a bit, you'd be more believable. And he did not mean that in the negative way. He was genuinely trying to be helpful. This is why I love science, is because science can take this question and look for data to support or disprove a hypothesis. So Naomi Oreskes, who many of you may be familiar with from The Merchants of Doubt, a great book and movie if you haven't seen it yet, Naomi, Michael Oppenheimer, and other colleagues said, we know that we are frequently accused of being alarmists. So let's take 20 years of climate projections from 1990 to 2010, and let's compare the climate projections with what actually happened in the real world during those 20 years. Now, as a scientist, I expected them to find that there was no bias either way, because we scientists are rigorously trained. It is beaten into our heads to be as unbiased as possible. Well, guess what? That's not what they found. What they found was that there was a bias, but the bias was in the opposite direction. Scientists have, in fact, been conservative in their projections, to the point where they coined a syndrome called ESLD, erring on the side of least drama. And they're suggesting that scientists, far from being drama kings, are like anti, anti-drama kings, queens. Because we are so terrified of being accused of being alarmist that we are subconsciously downweighting our projections. And that's not a good thing. Imagine going to the doctor if you had had a troubling, nagging, persistent, low-grade fever for years and even decades, imagine going to the doctor and the doctor telling you, well, you know, there's, it could be this or this or this. It's probably the best case scenario. I wouldn't worry about it. You don't want that kind of a doctor. You want a doctor who will take the worst case scenario seriously. But if the doctor is being constantly called alarmist all the time to the point where he feels like, or she feels like their professional reputation is being endangered, you can understand why that physician might shy away from talking about the worst case scenario. What else do we know now? We know that our choices matter, big time. A certain amount of change is locked in. But a much larger amount of change remains to happen depending on the choices we make. And that is why the Paris Agreement coming into effect this past week is so important. That is why the fact that Canada just put a price on carbon last Tuesday is incredible. And that is why, which we were talking about just before, that is why, although it isn't so sexy and it isn't so cool sounding, that is why a global treaty on aircraft emissions that was also signed last week is also essential, because it plugs one of the biggest holes in the national contributions to reducing emissions. Our actions and our choices today make a huge difference because, do you remember that ice core figure I showed you? With the, two, with the cycles? Let me show you that same figure looking at these two different pictures of the future. Ready? We're heading into unknown territory. That is what we know today. So let's turn to what do we think? And here's where the news personally gets even more negative, in my opinion. Gallup has been asking people, do you think the seriousness of global warming is exaggerated, dark green, or underestimated, yellow, or correct, light green? The last five years have been the highest on record of people thinking that the seriousness is exaggerated. If you look at the climate concern index, you see that it peaked, and then it's actually just been kind of going down since then. As a scientist, you're like, what? That makes no sense. And then if you say, how concerned are you about climate change? And you break out the answers by religious affiliation. I know this is very difficult and small to read. I'm going to highlight it for you. People who are orange, orange is very concerned, and light orange is somewhat concerned. So look at the orange. 
At the top, we have Hispanic Catholics. Hispanic Catholics are the most concerned people group in the entire United States about climate change. Did you know that? Then, for people with good eyesight in the front rows, tell me, who is at the very bottom of this list? White Catholics. And you may say, but hang on a second, don't they have the same pope? Yes, and that is where our understanding starts to connect on this issue. Because for a long time, white evangelicals have been at the bottom, but when you split out Catholics by race, we see that it isn't just about being evangelical, it's more about being white. When we think about climate change, this is the number one issue that comes to mind. So people's concern level, even if they agree it's real, is low. And when we look at this information as scientists and as educators, our first instinct is often to say, people need more information. I won't ask for a show of hands if you've ever thought that, but I get emails and messages on Facebook every single day saying, if you could just talk to, if you could talk to my congressman, if you could talk to my mother, if you could talk to my teacher, if you could talk to my student, if you could talk to the pastor at my church, if you could just tell them the facts. And if that's true, well, then the answer would be more reports, right? We had the 1990 IPCC reports, then the 92 and 94, then a whole new set in 95, and oh, they got out of date, so then 2001. Then we had another set in 2007, then there was a the set that we had most recently, but maybe IPCC isn't enough, maybe we need national climate assessments. We've had three of those, and I'm working on number four right now. Maybe their government reports. We need independent studies from the National Academy of Science, or another National Academy report, or yet another one. You get the point here. If I stack these reports up, they might reach the ceiling. Again, what I love about social science, this is a paper by Dan Cahan at Yale, what I love about social science is they can ask and they can answer these questions. Dan and his colleagues said, public apathy over climate change is often attributed to knowing too little. And again, this is the beauty of science. We tested this and found no support. In fact, people with the highest literacy were the most polarized. Now, follow-up studies has found that people who are actually literate in climate science do tend to agree more that it's real. But general scientific literacy, engineering, health professionals, is no guarantee of agreement on the issue of climate change. The blank slate does not work. The reality is, is that our blank slates have been written on by very competent hands for a very long time. And if you want to understand how that is happening, these are two excellent books that I highly recommend. Climate Cover-Up by Jim Hogan was actually so depressing that I seriously considered quitting climate science for about two weeks after I read it. It was around Christmas, so it was a good time. I could quit for two weeks, and then I felt better afterwards and came back. But it seriously showed me what we're up against. And then, of course, Merchants of Doubt we mentioned earlier. The reality is that the solutions do seem scary. I mean, think back to in history. What was the reason, the real reason, for the American Revolution? Taxes and tyranny. What do people hear when we talk about solutions to climate? Government control and carbon tax. So no wonder, those are literally what we call trigger words to the American psyche. And now we can start to understand the sensitivities attached here. We also see headlines. People using the Bible to prove that humans aren't causing global warming. And Lindsey Graham, who I think is a very acute perspective on things, saying the problem here is that Al Gore has turned this thing into a religion. And this is a key framing. I would argue it is not Al Gore who has turned it into religion. I would argue that it is people who do not want us to agree that have turned it into a religion. This was just literally from a couple of weeks ago, September 15th. The climate religion essay, the empire needs a religion of choice. Climate science fulfills the criteria for the new state religion. Now, I can assure you the person writing this was not in favor of a state religion. And this is a sign from a Baptist church. Mother nature never, father God always. There is a conflict being deliberately set up such that if you believe in God, which a vast number of people in this country do, as you can see from this Pew Foundation report, if you believe in God, a God, 
you cannot believe in climate science. Yeah. The reality, of course, is that, I love this headline, you can't believe in climate change. When people ask me if I do, my answer is no, because it isn't a religion. This is another good quote. Scientists do not join hands every Sunday singing, gravity is real, I will have faith. If I step off this platform, I'm going down regardless of whether I believe or not. It has nothing to do with my belief. But framing it so convinces us to reject it. So last question, how do we talk about climate change? We live in this incredibly polarized situation, but another study by John Evans, when we look at the reasons why that starts to give us a clue on how to talk, it isn't where we put our rear on a Sunday morning. What John found, this is John, I like to show you pictures. Kind of makes it more personal, right? You know who's talking. This is John. What John says is, when you control for demographics, it's not, and I said here, I was like, John, seriously? This is why social scientists get a bad name. Could you not just say going to church? It is not going to church, participation in fundamentalist Protestant discourse. See what I mean? It's not going to church. Opinions are rooted in age, political conservatism, and the Republican Party. And this is a great quote from Galen Carey, who is the Government Relations Director for the National Association for Evangelicals, who has strong statements on climate change. He says, many evangelicals oppose actions to slow climate change, not on a religious basis, and he completely nails this, but politically because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. So how do we talk about climate science? Remember Susie and Calvin? Don't start with the eight or 10 or 12 foot pile of scientific studies. Start here. Bond over what we have in common that we already care about. Connect that bond to our shared values. And then, this is the most important, always do not fail to end with solutions that we can agree on. Some solutions might already be happening, some need to be implemented. Because human psychology shows that if we feel like there is no hope, we as humans, our defense mechanism, all of us, no matter how rational we think we are, our defense mechanism is to reject the reality of the problem because we feel like we cannot contribute to fixing it. That is why solutions are so key when we talk about climate. Briefly, let me give you just a couple of examples for each of these, okay? Here we go. What value do I share with someone? This is often the most frequent question. Well, I'll give you one value. You're a human. That's a big one. But there's other ones. Um, I used to fish a lot when I was little. Many people do hunt and fish. Those, those activities are being impacted, as is winter skiing. I'm just giving you a snapshot of my life here. You can do this for your own life. I'm a parent, and I would do anything for my child. I speak at Rotary Clubs, and the first time I went, I was amazed of how the four-way Rotary test relates directly to climate. And when I restructured my presentation around the four Rotary quest or questions, you could just see the eyes opening and the heads nodding among conservative businessmen in Lubbock, Texas, saying, yeah, I get it. Perhaps one of the biggest ways we connect is through our faith, because again, over 80% of people in the United States have a faith that goes into forming their values, and all of us have some sense of the place where we live, and this is literally where I live. My house is just on the other side of those cotton bales. <laughs> Nearly every plant, human on the planet has the values they need to care about climate change. We just have to figure out what they are. Then we need to connect them. How do we connect them? Connecting them to caring about our children and their future. Connecting them to economics if we are a business person. This is a, a report by Hank Paulson and Michael Bloomberg. Connecting them to national security, a report by the Pentagon. And there's plenty of other DOD reports on climate. Connecting them to our weather and the challenges we face. Normal climate looks like this, and we live in Texas where it looks like this. Why do we care about climate change in West Texas? Because it's taking that crazy weather variation, it's stretching it even further. 
there's all kinds of reasons to care, and we can figure out what those are and connect them. The biggest one, perhaps, is this one, though. And this, I have little scripts written out that I can share with people if they want, but this is the one script I'm going to read. If somebody comes up to you, as a man did just yesterday in church, he came up to me and he said, I believe God controls the weather. What do you say to that? Now, first of all, if you don't believe in God, then don't go there. Don't make stuff up, <laughs> rule number one. But if you do, you say, I believe in God and I believe what the Bible says. And did you know the Bible says that we have responsibility over every living thing on this planet in book one, chapter one. And in the last book in the Bible, it says that God will destroy those who destroy the earth. So clearly we have the ability to do so. It isn't only negative, though. It's also about caring, not just about creation, but about people. This is where people live who are most vulnerable to a changing climate. Compare what happened in Haiti versus what happened in the United States with Hurricane Matthew. What was the difference? Vulnerability. We have a lot of signs in Texas, and this is a huge one. That love your neighbor thing. The Pope agrees with it. The National Association of Evangelicals agrees with it. This is an immediate connection that we can make. And then from there, we can say, how can we work together to fix this issue? How can Christians work together in community? I love Climate Caretakers. It's an online community for Christians to get an idea every single month of what to do. I love the fact that churches are putting solar panels on their roof and offering it to the community as a solar garden. I love the idea that Houghton College, a tiny little Christian college with 1,200 students, has the biggest solar array of any educational institution in New York State. Cornell, Columbia, they beat them. I love the fact that even though the majority of the country might disagree over whether global warming is caused by humans, the blue area, we might be able to agree on solutions because this is crazy. Look at this map. Anything orange is more than 50%, okay? So do you think that global warming is caused by humans? Huge parts of the country, no. Now, do you support regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant? Huge support for yes. Do you support funding research into renewable energy? Absolutely. Remember this, big difference between Trump supporters and Clinton supporters on is climate change real? This is the same study. Do you agree with hybrid vehicles, reducing your carbon footprint, fuel efficiency standards, corporate tax incentives, international targets like the Paris Agreement? Even though less people think the climate science is real, more people support solutions. And sadly, on the, on the other side, it goes a little bit the other way. Isn't that crazy? What if we could agree about solutions? Why do people want to reduce CO2 if they don't think it's causing global warming? I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> because if we do it, that's all that matters. What difference would it make if that is the attitude we had and we didn't have to agree on absolutely everything? What if we could agree that we're at risk, whether we live in Bangladesh or whether we live in Texas or South Carolina? What if we could agree that it's good to prepare for a changing future, whether it's floating villages in the Netherlands or sophisticated, rather than old school, irrigation systems in West Texas? What if we agreed that clean energy is the way of the future, whether you live in Floydata, Texas, or whether you live in Africa, where they're putting solar panels on thatched roof huts. What if we could agree on these things? I think we'd see some different numbers, don't you? So this is where I want to leave you, with the encouragement of what's already happening in Texas, where Georgetown is going 100% renewable, you know, just up the road, where Fort Hood is going renewable, where we're breaking wind power records, where we see incredible technology going in, like solar bike paths in the Netherlands. Who doesn't want that? Where we see tangible local benefits of air pollution reduction. And where the bottom line is this. You've probably seen this cartoon, right? What if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? I'm going to end with a quote from my favorite scientist who summarizes exactly what I'm trying to communicate here. Jane Goodall talks about bonding and connecting and working together in this quote. It is only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we can achieve our full potential.
Isn't that amazing? That's it. Thank you.